I've been saying, uh, thank you for sharing that verse, Caleb. Um, thank you, Jim, for finishing off your testimony yesterday, talking about uh, I am the true vine. Thank you for everyone who showed up yesterday and was picking up uh, branches and moving bushes and uh, all of these things being shared and done by people who had no idea that the sermon title was going to be Roots. And uh, so I'm just going to pray and then we're going to dive into this. Amen? Amen. Just uh, hold out your hands to receive. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are orchestrating things for us to learn from you, to grow like a tree planted by streams of living water. Father God, you don't want us to stay the same. You love us enough to change us, to make us more like your son. Let us see things the way you see them. Let them, us hear things the way you hear them. Let us love things the way you love them. Let us love ourselves the way you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So open your Bibles, open the apps, turn them on, whatever you need to do, you can pull them out. So I anticipating starting this new series, it's going to last about four weeks, and then I'm really excited that we're going to have a couple of guest uh, missionaries also with us then at the end of that. But uh, this series is titled Roots, and we're going to be talking a bit about the soil, the seed, the roots, and the fruits. Soil, seed, roots, and fruits. And I want to share a few verses just to kind of lay a foundation of where we're going and uh, let Scripture speak for itself. John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, then you will produce much fruit. Without me, you can't do anything. Again, just hearing conversations in the other room before I even started today, I'm hearing people quote these scriptures because this is what God is speaking and laying on people's hearts, not just mine. Matthew 7, 16 through 20, you will know them by their fruit. Do people get bunches of grapes from thorny weeds or get figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit and every rotten tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit and a rotten tree can't produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, you will know them by their fruit. What is it that makes an apple tree an apple tree? I mean, how do you know that it's an apple tree and not an orange? It produces apples. Jeremiah 17, 8, they will be like trees planted by streams whose roots reach down to the water. They won't fear drought when it comes. Their leaves will remain green they won't be stressed in the time of drought or fail to bear fruit. I'm reading from the CEB, Common English Bible, Common English Version. It says it a little bit different than the way you have if you're wondering, why does this look different than what, or sound different than what I'm looking at? The real question for us today is, why do we do what we do? And it's often because of our roots. I heard a story one time at a thank, of a family at Thanksgiving. And as the wife was preparing the ham, she cut off the ends of the ham. And the husband says, and she just threw it away. She's like, what? He's like, why are you cutting off the ends of the ham and throwing away this perfectly good meat? She goes, I don't know. That's just the way my mama always used to do it. So I have to know, I don't understand. She's like, well, this is the way we're gonna do it. This is the way it was always done. So mama comes and, and they're at Thanksgiving and they say, mama, why did we always cut the ham off on the ends and throw it away? She goes, I don't know. That's the way grandma always used to do it. <laughs> grandma, why did you cut the ends off the meat and throw it away? Was there something wrong with it? She goes, no, I just didn't have a big enough pan for the whole ham. <laughs> we do things. 
sometimes, and it has roots, it has history from our family trees and things that we don't even understand why we do what we do. There are roots to our actions, roots to our behaviors, roots to our opinions. Uncle Joe says, don't get married. You'll be asking for a ball and chain. Man's supposed to be free. And these opinions on couples have, have led to couples doing married things when they're not married. There are roots to our relationships. There's roots to our welfare, where we see generational poverty, where people living off of the welfare system because that's what their parents did. And that's the way they simply understand it. We see roots to our occupations, where generations of doctors upon doctors upon doctors I supposed to do? What have you called me to do? There's lots of things you can do, but take a moment to stop and ask God, what am I supposed to do? We're meant to produce something that is life-giving. And if you're not producing something, then maybe you need to get planted in something different. We're in the process of moving some of the plants because we're getting ready for the construction on the building. And there's been a lot of care that's gone into growing these plants that give life season after season after season, but it's come time. We don't want them to die and get crushed, so we're transplanting the plant to a different place. And even last week when we were talking with, with Bob out there about moving the tree because it's got deeper roots, he says, just watch out for the roots. Take care of the roots. And uh, if you're not producing fruit, perhaps you need to be planted in something different. The fruit that we produce, the fruit of the Spirit, they are love, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is what is supposed to be coming out of us, sometimes it's not so easy. Stephen, you don't understand. What if they spit in my face? I can't, I can't do these things. What if they really make me mad, Stephen? You don't understand the things that they do to me at work just makes me angry. Did you hear the things they said about me, Uncle, uh, Uncle Stephen? Did you hear the things they said about me, Pastor Rick? I can't believe they, they're, they're, they might not have said it, but they're thinking it. I know it. They did it on purpose. I was going through the drive-thru. I know I said it three times. No ketchup. They put it on there on purpose. Just they, they're, they're intent on boiling my day. I can't believe it. This pizza crust is only 10 inches big. <laughs> One of my kids, when we went out for pizza, what do you mean? I need a bigger pizza. We get upset over silly things sometimes, but we've got roots. Sometimes more seriously, we, we have a competitive attitude. Sometimes Christians, we're just mean. Sometimes we have a big ego. Sometimes we have a need for recognition but we have roots and often our roots are buried roots that we've had since childhood, childhood trauma, somewhere along the way, insecurity, abuse, or neglect. Let me tell you something, kids that are raised without boundaries, kids that are raised without pruning, kids that are raised without discipline grow up to be a tangled mess. And we live in a world that says, just let the kids be whatever they're supposed to be. They'll grow into what they're supposed to be. No, a, a bush that grows without pruning and guidance and showing which way it should grow, it's gonna die. It's gonna become a tangled mess. So our marriage issues have roots. Our commitment issues have roots. Our addictive behaviors have roots. I remember that I was really confused the first time I ever heard this word. Anyone know what horticulture is? 
No, it's not a culture of whoring. It's, it's a term that's referring to taking care of plants. A gardener is a horticulturalist. Fancy word for a gardener, kind of. Well, a good gardener, a good horticulturalist, knows that if you've got bad fruit, one of the first things you need to check is the roots. So often, when people are not producing fruit, we want to talk to them about, you need to produce more fruit. What's wrong with your fruit? Nothing's wrong with the fruit. There's something wrong with the root. There's a root cause to why people do the things that they do. And instead of us getting caught up with what they are doing or not doing, we have to understand there's a reason for it. And it's not that they, they really want to mess up your day. It's not that they really want to be bad Christians. There's something in the roots, in the soil, that needs to be checked. So today, we're going to start our root check. And for those of you who dye your hair, I'm not talking about checking to see if the roots are growing out. For those of you who don't like the dentist, I'm not talking about doing a root canal. However, this might be a painful process for some of us. So yesterday, we had a plant transplant, moving the plants and moving the trees. But today, we're going to check your soil. Turn to your neighbor and say, are you ready to get dirty? <laughs> so when you look at the soil, you need to examine the soil. You need to examine uh, when you're going to plant, when we were deciding where we were going to move the plants to, we, we started thinking about what's the soil like? How much time does this soil have in the shade? And how much time does this soil have in the light? So I ask you to check your soil. How much time do you spend in the shade? And how much time do you spend in the light of the sun? And how much water do you intake? And I'm not talking about H2O water, but in the same way that the parables and the verses we read is like a tree planted by streams of living water, and Jesus is a living water, how often are we taking a sip from his well, from his water? These are things to consider. As we were out there, we noticed that there was a big tuft of grass at one little spot in our backyard. And uh, Sam goes, you, you know where the grass is greener? It's not on the other side. It was near the septic tank. <laughs> grass grows more wherever fertilizer is. Things grow stronger once it's had a little bit of, it's gone through a little bit of doo-doo. I am, I'm not a, a wine connoisseur, but I am told that the wine from the vine that has endured hardship, in fact, produces better fruit, produces better wine in seasons that have been challenging. Our fruit is what is on display, and it's our roots that are hidden. The things that we do when... We are hidden. The things we do in secret, the secret place, the season we just talked about, the things in secret are the things that our roots are holding on to. We'd much prefer for people to simply judge us based on what we believe rather than what we display. But that's unfortunately not the case. Biblically, we can see it in John 13. 34 through 35, a new command I give you, Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another by this. Everyone will know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. Again, just echoing what we read earlier is that you will know them by their fruit in Matthew 7. We will be known that we are his disciples by our love and by our fruit for one another. How do you know someone loves you? I just know it, Stephen. I have a feeling. I don't know. That's a feeling. How do you know that someone loves you? It's a tough question. I mean, Charity even asks me, how do you know that I love you? They show it. They show it. There's evidence, right? 
Now, it's important. It's, it's what they do for you. It's what they do with you. It's how they do it. Sometimes it's not just doing something, but you can do something with a foul attitude. How do you love, how do you know that she loves you? Oh, she brings me a glass of water. Well, that's just an action, but how does she bring you? She gives your water. <laughs> love is a verb. What is a verb? An action. It's not a feeling. Love is not a belief. Love is an action. It is not a thing that you fall in and out of like a boat. Oh, we used to love one another. I don't know what happened, Pastor. The feelings just went away. We grew apart. If someone followed you for a week and you didn't go to church that week, would they still know that you're a follower of Jesus? If someone followed you for a week and you didn't go to church, would they still know that you loved Jesus by how you treat others? Because that is where our fruit is evident. But the issue is the roots. So let me clear up some confusion. We are not under the law of Moses, okay? Christ fulfilled that law. We're under the law of grace. And law, when we talk about works, the works done under the law, trying to check this list off was in order to obtain salvation. But in Christ, we don't have to do it to obtain salvation. We're under grace, we're alive, we produce good fruit. That fruit, is actions, but it's actions, not works to try and obtain something. Those, the fruit of the spirit is a changed lifestyle because of salvation. So instead of our actions and our works being to try and obtain salvation, Christ already did it so that we are saved. But if we truly understand his salvation and we truly understand his love, then we will start to produce a different type of lifestyle. The forgiveness we have when we start feeling that, that convict, feeling convicted like, like uh, Paul was sharing earlier, it's not just so that we go, oh, thank God I'm saved. I don't need to worry about it and I can just keep on doing my own mess because I'm forgiven. No, that forgiveness should provoke a response of a changed life that produces fruit, good fruit not rotten fruit, not the works of the flesh, which according to Galatians 5 are obvious, which means I don't need to read it, but if you need to check it, Galatians 5 tells you what the obvious fruit of the flesh or the works of the flesh are, Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit is a changed lifestyle because of salvation. Our salvation produces fruit as we abide in him. He is alive in us. And the Holy Spirit produces fruit through us. You ever go to the grocery store? Yeah, people go to the grocery store. We still do that, right? We don't just order it all, come to our door. We still go there, right? What do, they, what do they call the department where the fruit is? The produce department. Because the department has things that have been Produced fruit. Fruit are produced. Good fruit, good roots produce good fruit. Not genetically modified. Some churches are focused on behavior modification. You know, where we, we know how to behave Christian. We know how to talk Christian. How are you doing today? I'm blessed, Pastor. We know what people are looking for in church. Oh, they're singing a slow song. I should put my hands up. And I, I, I know Christian people wear deodorant, so I came prepared for this. I'm being silly. But we're not into behavior modification to try and please man. 
You see, some people try to focus on the fruit when they should be focused on caring for the roots. Everyone knows fake flavors compared to real flavors. It's like sometimes I wonder in these laboratories where they start mixing these strange flavors and they go, what, what does this taste like? Instead of trying to make a flavor taste like something, they just mix things together and go, what should we call this? I don't know, starlight sparkle something. It's, it's some sort of barbecue. It's just bacon flavor. No, it's not bacon flavor. It's definitely not watermelon flavored. You know, watermelon chewing gum, that does not taste like watermelon. Strawberry syrup and strawberry milk, sorry, not strawberries. Laboratory, laboratory altered seedless grapes taste like grapes, but they are incapable of reproducing anything. Genetically modified corn, if placed in a field next to organic field, will infect the organic field, making the organic field incapable of reproducing anything. And I hear next, genetically grown meat. I don't even want anything to do with it. <laughs> God wants real fruit. He wants real fruit. Now, real fruit takes time, takes care, and it takes love. It takes time, it takes care, and it takes love. There's a time and there's a season when you first plant a seed that it's not going to produce any fruit. In fact, some trees can take five to 15 years from the time that the seed was planted before it will even bear any fruit. And in fact, typically the first season that it produces fruit, you don't wanna eat it because it tastes nasty. But I applaud that little tree for trying. So this is a church where I want you to try. <laughs> And if you're not doing anything to begin with, that's okay. But eventually, once you've grown, you're supposed to produce something that is life-giving for others. And when you first get up and you first try and share a testimony, it sounds messed up and sounds weird. It's okay. That first time, it's expected. It's not going to be perfect. I, some, I am not a pastor that believes in perfection. I've tried it. It's stressful but I do believe in excellence, which means it's excelling, it's moving forward, it's getting better, that we, we're gonna make mistakes, but we're gonna get better. That's what we wanna do. So it's okay to fall and get back up. In fact, we're supposed to. Like I said, the, the vine that has been through some hardships produces better fruit. Why is it not producing fruit? Why does a baby plant not produce fruit? Because it's in a pot that is too small. It's in a pot that is too small. And, and a plant that's in a nursery, they call it a nursery where they start the, the seedlings to grow. And then they move it into a bigger pot and then into a bigger pot. Why are we so passionate about making room? Because I believe that as a body of Christ, we're supposed to bear fruit and if we're not seeing fruit, then maybe we need to make room and get ourselves into a bigger pot. When they were moving the plants from over here to over there, it required someone to be willing to get their hands dirty, to get in there and move them. So everything I've shared so far is all intro. It's okay. It's the intro for the entire series. So the actual verses that I want to get into and, and, and unpack are specifically to do with soil. It's okay. This is a shorter version. We're good. It doesn't have to be long to be good, right? Someone say amen. amen. I mean, I can preach long if you want me to, but you know that I can. Soil. <laughs> Turn we, if, with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 13. We're going to hear Jesus' words today. And there's a parable. There's actually a couple of parables we're going to look at um, that he shares back to back in Matthew chapter 13. Someone say amen if you're there already. 
So uh, verse three, he said many things to them in parables. A farmer went out to scatter seed. As he was scattering seed, some fell on the path. The birds came and ate it. Others fell on rocky ground where the soil was shallow. It sprouted immediately because the soil wasn't deep. But when the sun came up, it scorched the plants and it dried up because it had no roots. Other seed fell, on thorny, fell among thorny plants. The thorny plants grew and choked them. Other seed fell on good soil and bore fruit. In one case, a yield of 100 to 1. In another case, a yield of 60 to 1. In another case still, a yield of 30 to 1. Everyone who has ears should pay attention. So he said that in front of everybody. And then later on, the disciples came and asked, what does that mean? And so he explains it to the disciples in verse 18. Consider then the parable of the farmer. Whenever people hear the word about the kingdom and don't understand it, the evil one comes and carries it off. What was planted in their hearts. This is the seed that was sown on the path. As for the seed that was spread on rocky ground, it refers to people who hear the word immediately and receive it joyfully. Because they have no roots, they last for only a little while. When they experience distress or abuse because of the word, they immediately fall away. As for the seed that was spread among thorny plants, it refers to those who hear the word, but the worries of this life and the false appeal of wealth choke the word, and it bears no fruit. As for what was planted on good soil, this refers to the one who hears, understands, and bears fruit and produce. In one case, a yield of one to a hundred, another uh, 60 to 1 and another 30 to 1. And then he moves on and he tells another par parable to them. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like someone who's planted good seed in his field. While people were sleeping, an enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat and then went away. And when the stalk sprouted and bore again, the weeds also appeared. And the servants of the landowner came and said to him, Master, didn't you plant good seed in your field? Then how is it that, that we have weeds? And he responded, the, an enemy has done this. So as I unpack this, I just want to go ahead and let you get something out. I want you all just to say, ouch. 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 Okay, because as, as I say some of this and unpack this, some of this might hurt because it's cutting to some of our roots. It's pruning us when we realize where we're at in this mix of soil. So the first type of seed landed on the path. It says that birds came and ate it. This is the type of person who would uh, come to church and they simply don't understand the word that's being shared and they don't even make an attempt to try and understand it. It says the evil one comes and carries it off. This is the, the one who doesn't take notes. In fact, by the time the sermon is done, you've forgotten everything that was shared. And if not by then, certainly by the time you got home, say, so what did you get out of church on Sunday? I don't know, but it was good. Ouch. It's for the one that doesn't take the time because producing, taking care of the roots takes time, takes love, and it takes care. It doesn't take the time to try and even memorize the word, the scripture, so that we can have access to it at all times. It's supposed to be planted inside of our heart, is what it says. Is the seed is supposed to be planted in the heart, and the bird came and took it away. In fact, the devil, we know the devil loves to come and still kill and destroy. But what he loves to do is stop you from even being in a place to receive in the first place. So when you're thinking about coming to church, you're like, I just don't feel like it today. 
The devil is one before you've even had a chance to receive the word. If your response to showing up at church is, I'm too busy, I got a lot going on, that's the seed that falls on the path. What about the seed that falls on the rocky ground where the soil was shallow and the sun came up and it scorched the plant and it died because it had no roots. It says it had no roots and it lasted for just a little while. This was something that, that jumped out at me. I've read this passage hundreds of times. But the thing that jumped out me reading in this translation was that it died because of the distress and abuse that it was experiencing because of the word. The Bible tells us that he, he hates us, but he, the, the, the enemy and the world hates us, but remember that the enemy hated him first. He is the word made flesh. He, Jesus is the word. Jesus is inside us and we're in him. But when we're persecuted, because of what we believe, because of what is right, some people can't handle that. What? What do you mean, Stephen? I thought life was supposed to be perfect once we accepted Jesus into our life. Wasn't it all supposed to be all hunky-dory from here on out? I was told that if I just believe in Jesus, he'd solve all my problems, bless God. I'm not buying it. So this is the type of believer that's looking for a church that tells them what they want to hear. This is a church hopper. This is a, a person who attends church like they attend a restaurant. What do I feel like listening today? Ah, oh, man, we haven't got a lot of time. Let's, let's go to the, the church that's done in, in and out in an hour. Can't be going to that church. It'll take six hours to do anything. We're a church that makes room for the Holy Spirit to move. And we're a church that makes room for fellowship. Because those are the two greatest commands. Love the Lord your God and love one another. On these two things hangs all the other laws of the prophets. They're the people that attend church. Amen, pastor. That was such a great message. Two weeks later, you can't find them. So, how do you get past this? If you think, man, I, maybe I'm one of those, you have to get plugged in. You have to set your roots, roots deep. If they are only shallow, when the storm comes, it will just blow you away. C, the third point, among thorny plants, seed among thorny plants, the world is filled with distractions. It says that the worries of this life and the false appeal of wealth. Again, this is different words than, than I had read it previously. It's always nice to read something in a new translation. Sometimes things pop out to you differently. But the worried worries for this life is, is are where we get our, the actual word is care, anxiety, and fears that the world has. And false appeal of wealth. The actual word here is de for deceitfulness or seductiveness. Essentially, trust in wealth. A few months back, I shared a message on how trust and fear are, are rooted from the same word. How closely these are is that are we trusting in God with our fear? Are we trusting in God with our wealth? Now, notice it says false appeal of wealth, meaning that there is actually a good or a true appeal of wealth. And the difference is when you get that wealth, are you trying to hold on to it? In which case it will rot. Or are you sowing that wealth? Because your wealth is also a fruit. Your wealth is a seed. And if you are trying to store it up, it will rot. But if you receive that wealth and you sow it, it can reproduce for the kingdom. And the Bible tells us that he will give seed to the sower. I'm not talking about a prosperity message of name it and claim it. I'm talking about God will bless the sower so that he can continue to sow. There's false teachings out there and that's the thorny plants that grow up around us. 
false understandings about worry and wealth. Instead of investing in what the world tells you to invest in, is perhaps we should invest in his trust fund. <laughs> Can I get a big amen? Invest in his trust fund. Because <laughs> he is faithful and just. You can't outgive God. We, in, we invest in the stocks. We invest in all these other things, and they, they go, and you're like, well, what just happened there? But you, you invest in good soil. Good soil. Good soil was the fourth type of soil. It says that they heard, they understood, they bore fruit, but not just any fruit, fruit that reproduces. Hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold. This is like if you put a, one seed in the ground and it grows a tree. And you just take one of those fruit off and inside of it, it's got multiple seeds, not just one. Or if you plant it and it grows a tree and it has a hundred fruit. The last type of soil is technically from a different parable. It's poisoned soil. And it says that the soil was actually initially good soil. The seed was planted and then the enemy came after it was planted. The enemy comes to try and plant seeds around you. And again, the thing that jumped out at me in this one is when did the enemy come? It came when they were sleeping. The enemy came when they were unaware, when they weren't paying attention, when they left the field and no one was guarding the field. And what is the field? Where is the seed planted? In your heart. Guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. This wasn't just a, oh, well, there's going to be weeds around us and we can't do anything about it. You, you're going to have weeds around you to be careful of, but you can help prevent the enemy from planting it by guarding your heart, protecting your garden, protecting your nursery. Let me tell you something. Pathway Church is committed to protecting its sheep. That's you guys. You may not feel like a little sheep. You may not feel like a little plant, but the Bible tells us to that let the little children come to me and that you have to come to him as a child. We're committed to protecting our sheep that he has entrusted to us. We're committed to keeping you safe. We're committed to providing a safe space for you and for the children and for the youth. Why are we talking about youth so much? Why are we so invested in youth? Why are we, we don't even have them yet while well, we're preparing the soil. Stephen, anyone could do the children. Why are you and Charity do, doing that? Charity's up there right now. Why? Because that is fresh soil. I hate to break it to you, but adults, you've got some polluted soil. <laughs> you've got some, some big rocks in there in the way. You've got some weeds that have been planted, and it's hard to dig those out. And you're like, man, I didn't even know this was here. And as you start to unpack your dirt and try and do some care and transplant it to good soil, it's unpolluted soil, it's fresh dirt, it's young dirt, it doesn't have the rocks, it doesn't have the weeds. Did you know, someone write down 6%, 6% of adults make their decision to follow Christ over the age of 18. Now, what that means is 94% of believers made a decision to follow Christ before their 18th birthday. Churches spend 94% of their budget on the adults. Something is wrong with that. And we're trying to shift that. I'm speaking to the choir because I know how generous you are that you are workers and you are gardeners and you are sowers of seed that help make it possible for these not only to attend Ascension Convention 
and get the curriculum for this discipleship that they're about to go through. I know you're committed and you're passionate and many of you pray for them regularly. Some of you, I have already even seen pictures where they've got like a, almost like a tree or a prayer chain where they have the names of the youth and the children and each day they just rotate them and the next day they pray for one of them and the next one and the next one and the next one. You can do that too. You are prayer warriors. You are gardeners. You are co-laborers in the field. The harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. So as you see us try and invest our time and our attention on the youth, it's because they need to be protected. They need to be nurtured. They need to be watered. They need to grow. And thank you for those of you that do. My daughter's life changed because of it, as you heard earlier today. Praise God. I have good news. Anyone like good news? Yes. Amen. Good news is good news. It's the gospel. Malachi chapter 3. This is a passage that often talks about tithe and offering. But let me tell you something. Christ is our first fruits. He paid the way for us. Okay? He is already our tithe. But essentially, we still have to put our trust in God, like the passage we read today with our finance and our fears that comes with salvation, that we do trust him. We trust him with our whole life. When we trust God with our fears and our finance, we cast our cares and our emotions about what's going to happen next. We cast those cares on him. When we trust God with our provision for what's going to happen next with our life and we entrust that to him, basically when we put him first in our life, it comes with some promises. Malachi 3, 11 through 12 says, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit in your field, says the Lord of hosts, and all nations will call you blessed, for you will delight, says the Lord of hosts. The enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy the word planted in your life. Get deeper roots. Get plugged in. Bear fruit. And if you're not bearing fruit, check your roots. Let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the fact that you are the light of the world. You are the true vine, and we get to be part of that plant. You have grafted us in. Lord, let us grow our roots deeper into your truth by streams of living water. Lord, it's not our works, it's your fruit. That we would reflect the tree, the body of Christ that we're supposed to be. That we would walk in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. As we abide in you and you abide in us, Father, let us take the nutrients that you give us to help us grow and become the tree that you want us to be. Bending beneath the waves of your mercy. Oh, how he loves us. We thank you for your word, Father. I pray that you would bless your people as we go today, that we would, as your word says, be called blessed by all nations. 
and that we would delight in the fruit of the land.